So today on Simply Happy Conversations, I have with me Sharon from The Functional Family. She is an ADHD coach and she helps families to streamline their day-to-day -day tasks. So welcome, Sharon. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I know it's so great to have you and I'm sure you're going to share some wonderful tips with my audience, which is great. So maybe start with how um, things that you like to do in your free time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I... I uh, have three very active little boys, as you know, <laughs> uh, and a husband that has ADHD as well. So we're a very intense, uh, very active household. Um, so anything that I do in my free time has to be about decompressing and, and, and relaxing because to live with this sort of momentum, I love to you know, have some time out. Um, so I enjoy being anywhere near the sea. I love looking at the ocean. Um, and spending time with friends and cooking lots of beautiful food. And, and um, they're, they're the things that kind of make me happy. Very simple, chilled out things that I can do at my own pace. Anything that slows it down a little bit, I, I enjoy. <laughs> so is it walking at the beach or is it just sitting or reading a book? What sort of things do you like to do? Anything near it. I do yeah. enjoy the walk. I do enjoy, um, I don't go in it as much. I got stung by a stingray a couple of years ago and it's freaked me out, but um. But <laughs> I do like looking at it. I think it's really calming, just breathing in the sea air mm. and just being there and hearing the sounds of the, um, of the ocean. It kind of reminds me of growing up um, in Queensland. So I, I really like it. <laughs> it probably got better water temperature than ours. Ours is like freezing. So I don't go very <laughs> often either anymore. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about the functional family and how it came about. Yes, sure. So it's it's it was born out of pure necessity, really. Uh, I have three boys with ADHD and my husband with ADHD as well. And when our first son was diagnosed, I, um, I, I just sort of was started to look around for resources that could help our family. And there was a lot about how to help the child. Um, mm. And we went through this big gauntlet of just trying everything. And we really threw so much. I think we spent about $30,000 just trying to, you know, help him and give him as many tools as he could, uh, as we could. And it, in the end, it sort of just exhausted our whole family. Like <laughs> we were all exhausted because everyone's giving homework and everyone's giving um, work to do. And we our home life just sucked for once of a better word. Like it was really, really tough, our home life. So we could do things to help him, but our home life was not sustainable for anyone. And, um, and it wasn't very enjoyable to be in our house as well because we've got a husband that can't regulate, a son that can't regulate, like everyone was very intense. And, and uh, I just thought there has to be a better way um, for us to run as a family. I wanted to have a happy, joyful home uh, and not one that was just so angry and yelling and, you know, and, uh, and there was just always so much intense energy coming from this home. Uh, and so I, we started trialing and testing everything. I started interviewing experts in the industry. I started um, just documenting everything because I'm a big procedures person. <laughs> so I yeah. was um, trialing things, writing it down, and then writing out outcomes, expected outcomes, what happened, adjusting things. And we'd look at areas that were a problem in our home and then look at possible solutions of things that I could do to um, work better for my husband and for my eldest son. And then, of course, in that time, um, you know, of studying ADHD for 12 years since he's been born, um, I've had another two sons as well. And so the, it, I've really got a good sense of what works for these families and what and what doesn't. And, um, and that's when it was not until someone came over and they were asking questions about it, like, what are all these charts? What are all these visual cues? Like, oh my God, you need to share this with people. Yeah. And um, I decided to put it all together, all the knowledge that I had and um, really package it up and distill all this information out there down into these really bite-sized chunks. And that's why um, I wanted to help other families as well using this information that I'd created. And we're there to support people and, and to support um, particularly, I'm quite passionate about supporting the, the primary caregiver, whether that be the mother or the father, um, because they just take a lot of negative feedback from the world and a lot of, bear a lot of the grunt of, of all the work. And, and um, I really wanted to support them and make them feel like they had a nice, safe space um, to, to, you know, to support their whole family. Because if you look after that person, then they're in a better position to look after the child as well. So that's what, where the functional family came out of. It was just pure need to help my family, but then now we can help others as well. 
It's so it's so great having your resources out there. And I think I stumbled upon you years ago <laughs> when my son was first diagnosed with ADHD. And I remember using one of your strategies. It was like a circle, like yes. writing down everywhere we went and doing it in a circle with a, just an arrow. And we used that and it it made a huge difference. So, and that's, yeah, so that was years ago that I think oh. I stumbled across you from um, resources for ADHD. So, oh, yes. that's wonderful. And, you know, all these strategies are just simple. You know, they're, they're yeah. simple from someone who lives it every day, but we know that ADHD brain is an anxious brain. Mm. So if we can do things to comfort there, like if my, my motto is that we can't, uh, we don't necessarily want to change their brain, right? Mm, so right. I, I'm not about fixing ADHD yeah. at all, um, but we can and we are in control of the environment around their brain. So my whole, um, you know, idea behind helping these families is to help them set up the environment to work with the ADHD brain. And a lot of that stuff, just like that circle to-do list, is just simple and takes like, two seconds to do in the car you know when you're out oh you know when you're leaving the house but it helps the child so much and it stops the meltdowns which helps the parents and it really um makes everyone feel secure knowing what's going to happen what you know when they're going back home showing the home um, yes. there as well so knowing that they are going um back home and if they're not coping that that that's only one little uh, small step step you know, they are going, returning home. So it's a nice feeling of security as well. Yeah, that predictability, isn't it? Adding yes. that in is great. So then tell us how you help families navigate ADHD and simplify their lives then. Yes, so one of the, the things that I, that I love to do um, is to look at um, predictable problems for these families. So we have a, a whole six-week course that takes parents through this whole journey. We increase their knowledge about ADHD and then we start addressing predictable problems through, um, through the program. But there's also coaching and there's also um, lots of free re resources with blogs and uh, interviews and, um, and, and podcasts and things that I do as well. Uh, but if we, if we just look at the predictable problem section, um, so often in, in life, we come up against the same problems again and again. And it might be something as simple as, you know, you always lose your phone or you, yes. um, you know, or the, the, the washing's getting, not getting done or the child's having a lot of trouble with transitions. You know, you're having trouble getting them out of the house. Um, if that's something that you're experiencing every day, and for most families, it really is the mm -hmm. same problems every day. Occasionally, there's a curveball that comes out of nowhere and we have a meltdown, but most of the time, the problems are predictable. Um, then I want families to look at it at, with a fresh set of eyes, instead of just being in the trenches and get exhausting themselves, what can we do to make those predictable problems a little bit easier? And even if it's only 50% easier, that's still easier. Mm. You know, over time, these little decisions and problems that we face, um, you know, wear us down as parents as well. Um, so I want to, <laughs> you know, like if you have to, <laughs> if you have to face these things every day, you end up yeah. dreading it and it just builds this tension in your body. And that's why we find that so many, um, you know, women that go through the program, especially, and I, I do say women because I, that is mainly um, our audience is, is mums, mm. uh, but there is a few dads in there. Um, you know, I end up with things like chronic fatigue and mm. um, burnout and, you know, lots of autoimmune issues and, and things like that because we just are exhausted from dealing with um, problems that are largely predictable. And so we, what we want to do is create strategies surrounding those problems, things to make it a little bit easier. And so we don't just go through the same thing again and again each day, but we're creating strategies and giving our kids the skills so that they can address these problems. And through all of that, we're actually teaching our child that, um, you know, that they can look at things critically and look at things from an outsider's perspective and think, okay, how can I make a system to improve this particular issue that I'm facing? Um, and that is the bit that makes the biggest impact uh, for these families is looking at these things that they're going to just, it's like banging their head against a brick wall yeah. every single day. Yeah, and that's yeah. a bit that kind of lights me up because it only takes one little thing, like, you know, like you said, the, the circle to-do list and people go, oh, you yes. know, like that's, it just makes things easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll still pull that out even if I've got a little client in my car that I'm taking somewhere else, I'll do the circle and draw. This is where we are. This is where we're going. And so they can see visually and it's the circle. So they're coming back to their home, um, which, is, yeah, it's a great little resource and so simple. But yeah, makes a huge impact. So what about other than organisational tips that you have for families? 
have you got a couple of top ones yes yeah well by far like one of the coolest things and an easy thing to do is to give um, our beautiful children whether they're ADHD or not give them a launch pad at this at the front door or somewhere near the front Mm. door a central spot where your school bag is your keys are your wallet is your whatever you need you know like your after school activities give them a central spot where they that those things are always returned back to um, because all of those little so if you think about um, you know how the ADHD brain works like in general it's it's quite prone to distraction Um, and so it doesn't mean they can't focus they actually can focus when they want to but I tell you the things that they want to focus are usually not the mundane (laughs) mundane things um, like the everyday tasks Um, so we want to really yeah like they're not interested in that bit Um, so what what we want to do is make those bits as, as smooth as we can so the boring everyday stuff we want to just streamline that and so anything that we can put group like with like things that they need group those things together um, a launch pad is a great way an easy way of you know creating putting all your school bag and all the stuff you actually need for the day in one central location um, visual cues are fabulous so thing having things up on the wall reminders um, I do love those space talk watches where you can set reminders in their phone um, routine Uh, you know just if you think about the analogy of learning to drive and when you first learned to drive um, it was so taxing like you're checking Mm. the mirrors and you're checking the um, revision mirroring you're never quite sure where you are and it it took a lot of energy and uh, and now when we think when we drive like I don't know I'm like drinking a coffee I'm thinking about what I'm like I'm I'm totally it's it's an automatic thing to drive now Um, I'm definitely not like as actively engaged in it as I was when I was learning it. And that is kind of where we want to get our kids to with the routine side of things. And Because the more that repetition that we do it, the more less, the less brain space they actually have to dedicate to those boring stuff, boring tasks. Um, and that comes through repetition and habit. Uh, and so, you know, the easier that we can make that for our beautiful kids, the, e- the less work they actually have to um, you know, have to put in less brain energy. They have to actually dedicate to those things that they're not interested in. And there's so many tricks and hacks that you can do to make that easier for your child. Um, you know, it, it's not about just sticking some sort of glamorous routine up on the wall and going, yeah, there we're going to go use that now. Yeah. Like, you know, how many times have we all done that? We've like made it pretty and we've written up some <laughs> schedule and then no one ever looks at it again. There's lots of um, tricks that we use to integrate it into daily lifestyle. We really want those sorts of things and that that skill of being able to refer to, you know, either a visual cue, a routine or a chart um, to be like the, the baseline for these mm. beautiful kids because it really helps. It really helps them. Yeah. And I uh, an example is for my son that is a checklist like he'll you know use the xbox and then it's just a complete mess like there is stuff everywhere I'm just like I don't even know how you made it like it is now <laughs> so it's like got a little checklist so depending some days he's great he'll just go and tidy it up but if he's stressed and anxious there's no way he can remember all of the little things so there's a visual for each of those things that goes back there that goes back here and it's just like just check the checklist um if you can't remember what to do and he'll do that now so that's worked really well and um I know launch pads are fantastic and I work with families in their homes setting those up and it makes such a difference for their for their children to be able to find their things and be able to leave um, because they're in the one spot whereas you know if the shoes are there but the socks (laughs) are in the drawer and by the time they go to get the socks, they're distracted in their room with yes. something else and they're <laughs> not putting the, that's why they're not putting the shoes and socks on. So it's making those really small, you know, tweaks, isn't it, in the home to be able to avoid the distractions. And even eliminating choice in a way. Like, yes. you know, if you have to, every time you go for a cup, you know, you've got all different cups, and but everyone likes the one cup, yeah. you know, like, and you've got to look at it every time to look for your favourite cup, like, all that stuff is just a decision that takes energy. Like just Mm. get all the one cup, like, (laughs) you know, just make it all the same. So you don't have to actually make a decision every time you go to get a drink, you know, Um, that that eliminating choice, you know, is is such a great way of saving brain energy because Mm. these things can hold, hold our kids. Like they, they, 
you know, they, they well, even halts me, to be honest. Like yeah. you've got to stop and you've got to think about it for a second. Like it's, it's, it slows things down. So we can make it nice and smooth for them, but just keeping everything nice and consistent. Yes, even socks. We went yes. to buying the same pair, same colour, same brand of socks, and that's helped. My son's like, it's like been the best thing that we ever did, as well as we don't have to necessarily pair them either because they just yes. get chucked in a little box and there is socks there yeah. for him to pull out. Um, so have you got any examples of clients that you found, you know, that have made a huge difference to, to their lives? Yes. Uh, so over the course of, I think it's like four years that we've been running the Functional Family, we've actually helped 15,000 um, wow. families and uh, something I'm super proud of. And actually, Congratulations. Oh, thank awesome. you. One of the things that I love the most is our regional reach. So we actually, yeah, um, that's great. I like connecting, uh, you know, people in rural areas mm. to because we interview Sydney, you know, Sydney and the world's best specialists. I love that they get access to those incredible specialists as well through the interviews. Um, but I, I guess the the most thing, the the most um, beautiful feedback I get is that because we're just tackling individual problem areas, so we're looking specifically at things that come up a lot for families. So um, often those things largely are, um, you know, the transition, so getting ready in the morning. So we're, we're looking at strategies for that. That always causes a problem. Um, things like liaising with the school and how to talk to teachers and giving teachers the tools on how to handle our kids beautifully. Um, and then um, uh, th things like what to do when they get in the car, because most of the time, mm. you know, when you pick them up from school, they're ready for a fight and they're, you know, like there's a bit of, bit of um, you know, a predictable problem there. Often there's, a, yeah. often there's a lot of um, uh, sort of, I call, I'd say my son's ready for a fight in the afternoon. That's probably the only way I can describe it. Um, and then, and then looking at meal times and just making the life easier for that primary caregiver as well. I think we have to look after that person. Oh, um, so that's, I mean, it's, it's not one set strategy, but rather looking at each individual problem area, um, mm. something as simple as transitions that that causes a lot of families problems where you, where you put a time, a time crunch on, um, just to give an example, a time crunch on an ADHD child, like we've got to get to school by 825, right, <laughs> you know, and that time crunch, combined with all the things that they have to do in the morning, can be a big problem like it just is, is a meltdown it's meltdown central so even if we can improve that one area just by doing you know like having the routine in place having countdowns time uh, like visual timers and things like that some kids respond really well to that um you know that can make a huge difference for a family because imagine for, from a parent point of view and even from the child's point of view if you spend the whole morning fighting and arguing and then you get to school and you're expected to sit still all day like that is that is a chaotic um, you know, and the mums cry, like, you know, I've done it as well. I've cried in the car when I've dropped the kids off. I'm like, oh my God, someone needs to film that for a documentary. <laughs> like what has just happened in my house? Um, you know, but the versus the difference when things sort of, you know, you know, they might not always be quiet, but they, they are um, moving at a nice pace and the kids are able to do things um, sort of semi-independently mm. and, um, and the mum feels like she's kicking goals. Like that has a huge um a ramification for all the families like a positive effect um yeah. if if the parents feel like they can actually make some positive changes and they're not just sitting there surviving it just going oh my god how long to go till i can you know drop these kids off yeah uh, because i can't cope with them being here and um and you know so th those are the things that i'm most proud of you know parents saying that they're actually enjoying their children that they have more time um and that they have more time to uh address predictable problems because all of this problem solving it takes time it's no good if you don't have any time if you're already time mm. poor so the first thing that you, we have to do is we have to make things easier for these parents and so that they have time to deal with this stuff because it does take time to sit down and ask your child like you know what what do you what do you need like can you tell me what you're feeling right now you know um so we need to give these parents back the time so streamlining things like i know mm. you're great at decluttering um making uh making the the environment suitable is is one mm. of the key factors in that you know even something as simple as meal planning don't take i don't take my adhd kids to the shops for any reason no, like there yes. is there is no way there is no way I, I like i'll do it in an emergency but i'm not doing it if i don't have to like get your groceries delivered get everything yep. delivered. You know, like make things easier for yourself you know um because yep. there's a lot that goes on it's it's a lot to be a parent of adhd kid it's actually one of the most um 
you know, people sort of simplify it down into an attention issue, um, mm. which, which kind of implies that it's just at school. But as you would know, like it's so much more than that. It's, it's yeah. so emotional and so, um, you know, like there's so much that goes into to parenting these kids and giving them the skill because we want them to be functional adults at the end mm. of the day too. Yes, you know? yeah. And do you find that you have then the adults might be ADHD who also do the program generally? Yes. Who, or is it the other caregiver who's not, who's, <laughs> who's, who's taking on all the advice? It's a mixed bag. Right. It's a mixed okay. bag. So generally um, we, we know, I think it's about 70% um, that uh, ADHD is passed down Mm. you know from a, from one of the parents usually like I've most seen the common presentation that it's coming from the father's line but that doesn't necessarily mean that um that it's it's you know often there's mums with ADHD as well mm. and that's why we've created like that's why we do things in real bite-sized chunks because I think if you were to just lob everyone with all the information like it's just it's just too much and that's what happened to me when I started researching there was just so much information and a lot of it conflicts and, um, and I had to kind of distill it down into what was going to work. Like what, mm. uh, you know, the high level psychology strategies that are out there for ADHD, just, I, I can't, that's, that's not my vibe because a lot of them are not practical. Like, well, for my, for my boys, we're not practical on the ground. Like yeah. I had to be fast. I had to be able to respond and I had to, you know, like by the time I had talked through all of the things, you know, he had already forgotten about that and he was back up on the roof again, you know, like, um, yeah. <laughs> so I needed things that were quick and that were practical. And, um, and that's the bit that I love doing the most because I needed to give, you know, I needed to make it work in a snappy, snappy way. Yeah. 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 So. Um, that sounds great. I love, yeah. Just hearing all of those things and how much it must be making an impact on all of those lives, those families that have all been through the program and the ones that are out there who are ready to, you know, take it on this year maybe. Um, so how can people connect with you and find you? Yeah, sure. It's, so it's the, the website is um, www.thefunctionalfamily.com and um, we're also on Instagram and Facebook, um, which is at The Functional Family. And there is a, a free um, Facebook group that we support um, all our members as well, like any, any, any member of the public where they can ask questions and get support. And that's the, the Functional Family um, or oh, ADHD and Families uh, Facebook group. Um, you can link through that through the page. And uh, that's a really good spot where people can just mm. ask questions and get uh, get support from people that are in the same journey as them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really think that the parents need to give themselves credit for all the amazing work that they do do. Um, there's not many other, um, you know, disabilities that I can think of where the parents take so many hits from the public for their child's behaviour, you know. Um, there's a lot of negative feedback out there that that we get and it, and I, I think you might have heard me mention it before, but it's a little bit death by a thousand cuts, you know. You go to the school and everyone means well, but they're giving you negative feedback about your child there and then you go to the sports team and you get a little bit of ne negative feedback there and then you go to the, to the family function and so-and-so, you know, like, yes. oh, you've seen this behaviour there. And, and so in the end, all of that, all those nice, uh, well-meaning, often well-meaning, Meaning, um, you know, little bits of advice that everyone gives you just kind of wears you down and you start to think, oh, I can't take this child anywhere. And I, um, you start to get a little bit isolated by their behaviour. Um, and those, you know, that, that, that sort of stuff is, is quite taxing for parents. So I just wanted to say that, that um, the parents who are in the trenches mm -hmm. doing this every day, you know, they need to give themselves credit for getting up and backing, backing up, you know, every morning and, you um, and, you know, doing the best for their child and continually advocating for their child and for ADHD. And that's why I love podcasts like yours and any, any podcast that will get the conversation going about ADHD because uh, people need to know that it's, that it's quite substantial and that, it, you know, that it's not just attention. It's a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. And we've got, to, we've got to do our best to support these beautiful families and these beautiful kids who are really not getting a whole host of support uh, at the moment no definitely I think yeah connection is one of the biggest things I know for myself when my son was um, diagnosed with autism you know in the first place that you know just really helped because 
these people are in the same, you know, the same trenches as you doing, going through the same things and just are there to just listen, which is great, which I'm sure your Facebook group is the same, um, just having people there who understand you and can listen to you. Now, did I see somewhere that you've also got your own podcast or you're about to launch your own yes. podcast as well? Yes, Have you I sure it? am. Yeah, I'm about to launch um, about to launch my podcast, actually. I've been on lots of other ones, but I've kind yeah. of um, been stalling a little bit, but now... <laughs> <laughs> and I've just pushed you into it now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it is happening. It is happening. I've recorded the intro and everything just... You know, I had to get over listening to the sound of my own voice. Yeah. You know, I think like everyone else <laughs> has a podcast. Uh, but no, it's coming. It's coming. And I'm really super excited about it because, you know, I, I love um, any topic of conversation that we can we can have to, to support these families. And I think the, the more the merrier when it comes to this stuff because... Oh, that's great. You know, any, oh. Anything to help. Oh, I can't wait. I'll definitely share all the other links. But um, and then I can update the links once you've launched the po podcast as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Sharon, and sharing all those beautiful tips that I'm sure will help some of these families. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, thank you.